And so it's also interesting, though, to me, when you talk about what you'll be investing in going forward. And it's very interesting that you mentioned Amazon specifically. It's interesting because I saw you publish a video, um, a link to a video that you published on your website a few weeks ago, I guess. That, what do you call it? Uh, oh, yeah. You, so you called the world is crazy, but you don't have to be a victim. And so I wanted to ask you how to do that and, and how you how you build that uh, shopping list of yours. You know, you often refer to that in your interviews. And so um, if you still have the minute, I know we've been at it for a while now, but if you still have the minute, you can tell me what does a sector and then maybe even a company need to have to end up on that shopping list of yours. I'd, I'd appreciate that. Well, I think it's more of a strategy, Antonio, than a shopping list. Like, you know, I, I could see Amazon just as an example. And this, that I just picked it as a big name. It's right. not a recommendation or, or, and I may not do that. It could be something else or not. Um, but the idea of being a contrary, I think is the key point here. Um, the other one that we talked about earlier of not buying gold and silver physical in your direct personal possession and control, that's not a speculation, that's insurance. Uh, you know, our, my friend and mentor, Doug Casey likes to say that in a depression, nobody wins. The person who wins is the one who loses the least. I'm not sure that's true. I mean, if you could be the great Gatsby and cash out before the crash and maybe not be a criminal and end up in jail or anything like that either, right? But you know what I'm saying, right? There's, there's always a mania somewhere. And, oh, gosh, I sound like Kramer. I did not say that. <laughs> um, but there are opportunities. And, you know, I, I just outlined one. I think that if we see a reflationary boom and the safe haven demand, or we're wrong about, uh, you know, the monetary policy being bullish for gold and silver, I think that's very bullish for copper. So I think that the thing to do is to look for contrary trends. I think the thing to do is to be a contrary, willing to buy what gets sold for the wrong reasons. Like if we have a market crash in the weeks ahead and uranium goes on sale, I would absolutely see that as wrongheaded. I would, I, you know, it'll be, it'll be difficult for me to not put all the cash that I have saved up in uranium stocks at that time, because it's my highest conviction trade for the year ahead. And if they go on sale, that would be fantastic. So, but the willingness to, it's, it's one thing to say that, or here's another thing, you know, there's that famous Rothschild quote about blood in the streets. It's, it's easy to grasp. Everybody understands it, but it's, easier said than done when that's actually happening. So like when we had the crash of 2020 and you've got panic, nobody knows what the real dangers of the virus are. I mean, at that point, we really didn't know how serious it could be and what the you know effects would be, right? It was still very early stages. It's a huge scare. Um, that was actually a blood in the streets type opportunity in a literal sense, right? People were dying. We didn't know how much or how many, but people were dying People were shutting down. Governments were locking people down. That was a blood and streets opportunity. And if you had the courage to buy at that time, then you could do really, really well. Uh, so even in a you know, worst case scenario, okay, maybe not worst case, but very bad case scenarios, I, I think it's about being a country and a courageous country. And this brings back to something you and I have talked about several times in this video is where do you get that courage? Like, how do you do that when that actually happens? And I think the answer is what we've been saying about focusing on the things you know. You know, if you're really excited about mining in that sector, become an expert in that. And then you know which things within that area make sense at that time and which don't, uh, as opposed to chasing after the flavor of the day. Mm. So I think, I think it's a strategic thing more than a shopping list thing. I, not, not to quote the Fed or anything, but I think I'd be very data dependent on that. You know, when it happens, when things start happening one way or the other, then I would take what I know, what I think I know, what I project, and how do the different opportunities at that time look? What presents itself as, you know, ticking all the boxes at that time? But, I, but I'm going to, you know, go out on a limb a little bit here and say that I'm, I don't agree with my, my friend and mentor, I think it's possible for people who have the contrarian courage to act on blood in the streets opportunity to not just survive, but I think come out way ahead in times of crisis. Hmm. 
Do you agree with him when he says that you have to have your ass, your assets, and your passport in three different jurisdictions? If you can, I think that's very wise. I see, the, apart from pr potentially a little bit of convenience issues, there's very little cost to that. And I know some people are very resistant to this idea, you know, uh, permanent tourism, whatever you call it. Um, but making it difficult for any one government to shut you down completely or, or seize everything in your life, I, I think that's just prudent. And if you think, oh, that can't happen here, I mean, remember the, the Balins in Cyprus and Europe saying, oh, yeah, that, that, we could do that too, right? You know, <laughs> or in the US, remember FDR confiscating privately held bullion. Uh, you know, if things like that can happen, you're not safe anywhere. And it seems to me to be just eminently prudent to whatever steps you can, baby steps, Antonio, towards internationalization are worth doing. And to actually live out of a suitcase like Doug and, you know, have a ranch in five different countries and have physical bullion stored, you know, in, in half a dozen places around the world or more. I mean, I'm not there yet, um, but you don't have to be. It, simply being, you know, having... A brokerage account in another country is a, is a step forward or, or having an allocated account for bullion storage in another country. It's an easy thing to do. Mm. I, I think every person owes it to themselves to think about if there are any minimal, least inconvenient steps I can do towards diversifying my political risk, they should. I think that's prudent. What is one thing, and I guess we already spoke about that. You told me about jurisdiction, but what is maybe something else besides that, that you would absolutely never settle on. You would never compromise on that one thing when it comes down to deploying capital, relocating capital, relocating yourself or something along those lines. Is it like, is it something big like freedom or is it something small like uh, having a good management team behind the company? No, I'm a hardcore libertarian and it displeases me to think of investing in ways that support tyrants and dictators. But you know, Look at Canada recently or the United States. You can't drive down a public road without providing some support to people whose ethics and morals I disagree with. So purity not being an option, I think I'm better served and actually posterity is better served by me accumulating as much capital as I can to become a force for good in the world um, rather than passing up excellent speculative opportunities because I don't like ex-country or ex-dictator. Uh, but that, so, so, but there is another thing. There's a, I have a metaphorical little black book where I note down anybody in the resource sector who lies to me or actively misdirects my attention or spectacularly destroys wealth for shareholders time after time, or even, you know, that's, that could be innocent. Not likely, but it could be, but less innocent when you have uh, management directors sh really throw the shareholders under the bus, you know, take a cash offer of a takeover that works for them in their share, you know, their seed round shares. But the retail who's bought over the last year or two you know, at a cash offer at a low price, it locks them into a loss. So people who do that just utterly disregard the outcome for their shareholders goes in the little black book. And that is, uh, That's an absolute deal breaker for me. When, when, when my take clients ask me for my take on a company and I evaluate it, I bring up the website. And the very first thing I do is I go to the uh, team or management or you know, the about corporate page and I look up the management and the directors. And if there's somebody on my blacklist on that team, I, I stop right there. Well, I mean, I need to go a little bit further to tell people what the story is and why I'm giving it a thumbs down. But personally, my, my decision is very easy. The triage is very easy. So political risk is one for no-fly zones and the people risk for, for people who I don't trust, I know have lied to my face or have destroyed a lot of shareholder value. You know, that is another one. Good points. Absolutely good points. I use, but I don't use it too often, the SEC full text or the um, SETI website for Canadians to sort of look up people's past. I would also look up a company that they were involved in. If, if the share price just went down 99%, 
I would ask them to explain that to me. I'd give them a shot. Maybe I'm naive still, but I'd ask them. Sometimes yeah. they get pissed at those me are, for those asking are good that tools. <laughs> Uh, just real quick though, with when you look up like on Canadian Insider, you see the chart and it shows all that you know green buying and red selling. Um, it doesn't necessarily explain why. Uh, it's important to understand if somebody is exercising options. You know that doesn't mean they're dumping shares, right? And sometimes a director will um, donate shares to a charity or something, and that's a disposition. So it can look like there's insider selling when there really isn't. So it, it, I'm, I'm not discouraging people from doing their due diligence homework on that. I'm just saying, be careful, you know, make sure you understand the data you're looking at. Uh, and, and I actually very strongly encourage that. I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's part of the due diligence. You know, people complain about how the MDNA and the financial statements for some company, and you know, it's a hundred pages long. Oh my gosh. I mean, yeah, you know, you, you want to be a millionaire, you want to speculate and make millions of dollars and you're not willing to spend a couple hours quality time getting to understand the company's financials you know if, if you make bad choices don't blame them that's on you mm. uh, you know you these are financial decisions you should take the time and by the way the financials are, are great sources of forensics i'm saying be careful you know watch out not to leap to conclusions but when you see that they're spending more money on gna than they're putting in the ground or you see you know repeated share consolidations and then new financings um, actually, this is a great source of detective work. If you don't have the luxury of flying around the world and kicking the rocks and all these projects yourself, actually, the, I think the next very best source of data is actually the company financials because they are required to file and disclose uh, a lot of stuff that they're not going to put in their PowerPoint presentation. Exactly. Exactly. Second best place is uh, probably in the pit where you, you ask them these <laughs> questions. Uh, which is fair game. That's also what I'm trying to do. Now, I'm not as sophisticated as you in asking them, but I'm trying to get there. And um, I think the space needs more of that as well, by the way. So kudos on that. And I wanted to, uh, something that I wrote down though, a point that you mentioned, you often refer to risk. And I, I, I would hear that a lot. Heck, I've started using it myself, but in times, I don't, if I'm being completely honest, in times I have no idea how to measure risk reward. Uh, like I don't know how to measure it on everything. So how, how do you go about that? How do you measure risk reward and what is a good risk reward in the end? And that's, uh, it's customary to say excellent question while you pause and collect your thoughts. But that yeah. actually is an excellent question. And I wish more people would think about this because it it highlights something about speculation, really. It, and keyword you use is measure. And the answer is you don't. And if you think you are, if you think you have a number that quantifies the risk, you're wrong, you're imagining, or you've been bamboozled, you, you've drank the Kool-Aid, whatever metaphor you wanna use. It, it, you know, we don't know what the price of the commodities is gonna be tomorrow let alone what these share price projections to do decimals a year from now are. It's ridiculous. All these brokerages that put out their share price projections, those are guesses. They may be educated guesses backed with a lot of math, but all that math rests on assumptions. And the assumptions are never right. They're at best other guesses. So your number that you're looking at is a guess based on guesses. It is, if it is ever right, it's purely by accident. Uh, it's that one grain of sand that fell on the bullseye out of all that spread. Now, this doesn't mean you're helpless. This doesn't mean you can't gauge any risk at all. So I'm saying, for example, Peru right now is too risky for me to invest. Peru is uninvestable for me right now under its current administration. I'm not giving you a number. I'm not saying, oh, you have 82.5% chance of losing money if you invest in Peru. I don't know what that is. And I think anybody who says so, they're just they're making it up or they're guessing, don't, don't trust these numbers. And this is a pet peeve of mine. There's another free article on the website called The Adventures of Spreadsheet Guy. I literally ran into a guy in the field in Africa carrying around his laptop, typing in guesses. He had his model, his mining model on the laptop. We were running around the DRC and he's typing in guesses. There's like five drill holes in this thing. And he's typing in guesses for how big the pit might be and how deep it might go and how what the grade might be. It is so premature. I mean, it, <laughs> um, but he comes up with a number. 
And he puts out a report to his audience saying, oh, well, I think, it, you know, here's a, here's a price target. I, I think that's grossly irresponsible. And um, so where am I going? Well, if, if I may jump in for a second, what I do do, though, is that I would make three scenarios being best, worst, and average. And if the worst case scenario is largely beneficial to me, that would suggest to me that the risk reward is skewed towards my situation. Is that, is that wrong? No, but if you put a number, like if my best, worst, and medium case scenarios are 30%, 50%, 70%, well, where are those numbers coming from? I, I'd rather just say, I see limited downside and more upside. I'm, the way I generally put it for my audience is, I'm happy to get the direction right. And if the direction, you know, if I'm right, you know, where copper's going up, I don't know how many any of these copper stocks are going up. I think this one has a smaller market cap. So its potential for a multiple is better than this big one, where maybe I'll be happy if I get a double or, you know, solid high double digits. But the big thing is I'm just glad if I got my call on copper right, because then all the plays work out. You know, however much or little money they make, they work out, you know, or most of them do, the ones that don't fall flat on their faces. And we make money. I make money for my readers. That's the real thing. I make money for myself and my readers. How much money, how big the thing was, that's all just guesswork. And honestly, it, part of the problem with these numbers is, okay, if your price target is this and your desired gain is this, then I might make a decision not to buy because it, it's trading right now two cents above what it would take for me to materialize that gain that I want. Um, but you know what? If I'm looking at a double or something and it's only 98% at the end of the day, that's good enough. I don't care. Does that make sense? So I, I, I really think that, well... Okay, so like if you, Antonio, personally come up with what you think it might be worth and a price target and an entry point target and you work that way on your own, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's, I suppose it's good if that gives you confidence, it gives you a reason, right? Um, you know, I've been so wrong on anything like that for so long that I'm just happy to get the direction. Right. My, my big objection and my warning to the audience is when you see these talking heads on financial media or you see these, you know, book report you know, phone book size reports from brokerage firms, you know, giving you this projection of our price target is this. It looks so solid. I call this the thud factor, right? You thud this report on the table. And it gives people, I think, false confidence. They think they know something. They don't. They've just heard a guess. And I think that's dangerous to the average investor. Mm. Fair enough. Fair enough. At least, as Rick Rowe puts it, if you're doing a back of the envelope calculation, you're probably doing more than the average speculator. So you're already <laughs> ahead of the game. So you might as well do something. Um, I was making a little drawing here uh, with like a house or um, a roof that says a Lobo success on it. And it's sitting on, I guess, a couple of pillars. So far, you only have two. I got place and people. Those are the things that you would not compromise on. What else am I missing? Or does your success really sit on only those two pillars? Place and people. Well, it depends, I guess, what kind of pillars. But we've talked about contrarian courage. I do think that's a pillar of success. And this is good news, bad news. I mean, it, honestly, Antonio, there are people who probably shouldn't be speculators. Mm. There are people that are very nervous. You know, at every downtick, they, they panic. Every uptick, they get excited, and they're sadly more likely to buy high and sell low. Like they'll chase in because everybody else is doing it, and they'll panic out because everybody else is doing it, and they will routinely buy high and sell low. So that's the bad news. Like if you're like that, sorry, uh, you know, maybe strict with ETFs or more mainstream investments, and you know, go to cash when you're worried, and you know, don't try resource speculating. But actually, I think most people are not that flighty. Most people, I'm not trying to disrespect the audience out there. I think most people are reasonably intelligent, reasonably calm. You know, under certain circumstances, they might get overexcited. But, if, but I do think there is some self-training you can do here. And what we were talking about earlier, I think knowledge is the key to courage. The, if you focus on areas that interest you, and it doesn't have to be all mining, Right? but you biotech or whatever really excites your interest and you become knowledgeable in that area. I think that helps bolster that courage. So 
But the pillar is courage. The, the tool or the access to it is knowledge. You know, don't be lazy, I guess, is a way of putting it. You can learn this stuff. Um, another mentor of mine, you know, David Galland from the Casey days, he read somewhere that a person, any person can become an expert after about 10,000 hours of study. Now that sounds like, ah, oh my gosh, 10,000 hours. But actually that's only a few years of studying something every day. And if you like it, if you're interested in it, you know, if you love cryptos and you study that space, a lot of young people have become far more knowledgeable about it than I probably ever will be because they chose to put that time in. So courage is one. And what else? Um, you know, I, I talk about my, my, one of my mottos is discipline pays. That's related. And I think that comes to being unemotional. You know, don't, as Doug likes to say, don't treat these resource stocks as family heirlooms, you know, be unemotional, be willing, be cold-blooded to, um, and that's, that's pretty close to courage, but kind of different, you know, it, it, to be merciless when it's time to sell, it's, it's, it's not exactly the same as courage, but it is a skill that I think can be developed. I think after a few painful lessons, it's not so hard. <laughs> you know, when you, when you have some big win and it slips through your fingers or claws, in my case, as a wolf, um, you know, that's so painful. You don't want to go there again. So it's easier to take profits, even though that hurts. You know, letting the profits slip through your fingers or claws hurts more. So I do think that kind of discipline is, is developable. I'm not sure I'm helping you with here with pillars, but those are some thoughts. Well, you're good. They're good thoughts. This, we, we could take this also a lot further, and maybe we should make a complete another a uh, masterclass or podcast or whatever on it, talking about stuff like the um, pre-prediction sweet spot, which Rick Rose has told me is the most important work that you've ever done so far. So that's something that's maybe interesting to talk about that's in there too. But I was just looking for general wisdom, which is what I'm right. getting, which is what I appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. Things like the PPSS, that's more of a strategy. Even the upside maximizer, that's a strategy in terms mm -hmm. of fundamental wisdom. Our friend Rick Will likes to say that, you know, your, your main enemy, your main thing that you have to overcome is to the left of your right ear and to the right of your left ear. But he's exactly right. That's one of the things he says, Rick Rulism, that I absolutely agree with. And the way I put it is the, way, the place to start is with self-analysis. And this may sound like pop psychology, you know, mushy. What are you talking about? I want a stock pick. Well, you know, if I give you a stock pick and you haven't started with that self-analysis, it might not be the right stock pick for you, right? I mean, it could be that you're on a fixed income, very risk averse, and you should stick with the majors or an ETF, right? Or it could be that you're 19, you've got no kids, you live with your parents, you couldn't care less if you lose, you know, this money that you saved up to speculate on and you want a hockey stick that's going to be a 10-bagger. You know, my more middle-of-the-road balancing risk and reward pick wouldn't be right for you. Mm -hmm. So, so actually I think this is a key takeaway that if you haven't thought about it, you really should, you should sit down in a calm room, no music, no family, no distractions and do some introspection. What kind of investor am I? What, how much pain can I take? How much FUD can I deal with? Right. Um, you know, know thyself as the saying goes, I, I actually think that is a key to success and it, it simplifies life. You know, if you know, these are the kinds of things that, it, that work for me, then all those other things, you can just discard them. It's part of your triage process. Don't need to worry about those. You know, oh, that's, that's not for me. That's too high risk or that's too boring for me. Plain vanilla. That's not for me. It, it helps to focus in on what works for you. Hmm. That's very, very, very well. I have this in my, um, I have a spreadsheet. I'm a spreadsheet guy. So I have a spreadsheet for my schedule and I have uh, three columns next to my spreadsheet. One of them says week, the other one says year, and the other one says uh, for me now 2025, because that's when I'm going to turn 30. And I, in there, I, I put the things that I want to have accomplished by, you know, by, by the end, of, you know, for this week or for this year and, and, and till I'm 30. And every time I'm supposed to take a decision, I would look at my schedule and I would also look next to that to say like, okay, does this bring me a step closer or would it bring me uh, five steps further if it were to 
to you know go bad or something like that. That's sort of how I I am trying to structure my decisions because but it looks beautiful on paper, sounds great on a video. You know, all these motivational speakers will tell you to do that. It's not as easy to do that in practice, but I'm trying. So, I, th- I think that's actually particularly for a younger person. Uh, I think that's a good starting point. I actually remember back in my restaurant manager days, I had goals and objectives, and, things, and I had a, a day timer, a thing called a day timer, which was a paper time management system. And it was quite expensive, actually. They sold this special three ring binder, which was actually like nine rings. But it was the different papers in there that were designed as time management tools and little grids and, you know, check things off as you did them. And you had daily chores and weekly and, and goals and things and all this stuff. Um, after a while, I simplified that to just a pad of legal paper where I would write down things that I was doing and prioritize them and make sure there's a very simple concept, Antonio, make sure that the highest priority things got done first. And if, if I ticked off just one of my highest priority items that day, the rest of the day couldn't, you know, it was, it was already a great day. I, I'm done. And if, I, and if I've done everything that I have to do today, all my high priority items, everything else is sauce for the goose. Mm-hmm. And, or I can go out on the beach because I've done what I had to do today. Nowadays, that's all internalized. I don't actually have a spreadsheet or a paper or a day timer anymore. Um, the closest thing is I use my, my email inbox as a management tool. Because if I have anything in my inbox, it'll irritate the piss out of me until it goes away. So um, that's, that's my reminders. Or, you know, I'll actually write a draft an email with a subject line as a reminder and put it in my inbox, an email to no one, but just because it's there. Yeah. That's about the only remnant of these old time management systems I still have. But it's not because they're not important. It's because I've developed the discipline. I've internalized them. That's the way I function anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, on the, on the bigger picture though, I mean, imagine, you know, ranging from say a mother Teresa to an Elon Musk, I don't think either one of those, you'd have to remind them what their goal was, right? yeah. You don't, Elon doesn't need a spreadsheet to tell him I'm going to Mars and mother Teresa doesn't need a management system to remind her to be kind to people. That's, that's who and what they're overarching, not just goal, but it's their way of being, it's who they are. Mm-hmm. I, I I think as a speculator, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm a saint or a, or a whatever Elon is, <laughs> but I'm saying that my goals are very clear. What I want to do with my business are clear enough that I don't need to have a sticky in front of me. I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing. That is powerful. And if I didn't have that, I would work on it. I would, I would want to clarify that. I would want to be at that place where I could write it down and stick it on there and so on. But I'm not sure how this, this helps the, the average investor so much. I think, I think it brings the up the question of goals and having that out there is good. Um, the particular system, whatever works for you. Um, but I, I, I think it is good to have self-discipline as mm-hmm. part of it, you know, whatever, whatever works. Exactly. That was exactly the thing that I was going to say. Like somebody might be watching this and a lot of people might have clicked away already thinking like, what is this vanilla stuff? This does not, this is not telling you how to be a successful speculator or whatever. But I think those are all small pieces of the puzzle that, and and self-discipline is a big thing out of that. So if you, you know, knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it, I think that if you apply that to your overall life, that's necessarily going to spill over to you being a successful speculator in one way or another. That's how I, I assume, obviously I'm not a successful speculator yet. I hope to be one day. So, uh, but that's what I assume it is. That's sort of my, my working thesis. So, well. Uh...